So the outline for tonight is going to be very simple. We're asking the question, is the Bible reliable? Now, why is that an important question? It's an important question because everything we know about Christianity comes from the Bible. Everything you know about Jesus comes from the Bible. What we know about creation in the spiritual realm comes from the Bible. And so it's the source book for everything that we know about our faith. And if we don't have a reliable book, uh, we're in trouble. You know, I, I grew up with the understanding, and I went to an Ivy League school, and they taught us this, that the Bible was a product of many translations, almost like the telephone game when you used to go to a birthday party when you were a kid. I would say something uh, to Doris like, I had a ham sandwich for lunch, but I'm going to have baked salmon for dinner. And then she would share it all the way around the room, and by the time it got over here, it would say, I had jam for lunch, and I'm not having dinner. It would just get corrupted. And that was my understanding of how the Bible was transmitted through the ages, that it was started in Greek and Hebrew, the original testaments, and then translated at some point into, into Latin, and then later translated into English, uh, and then we have many, many versions in today, today's English. Often when I get this question, it's not from an unbeliever. Most unbelievers have a pretty high view of the book. They don't know much about it. They've seldom read it. And, and, and sometimes I'll ask this question. I think it's a good one uh, to, to have in your arsenal is, uh, do you understand the message of the Bible? You know, because maybe they have a specific struggle with the message of the Bible. The message of the Bible from beginning to end is that we have a loving God who wants to have a relationship with us, but he can't because we're broken and not perfect and he is. And so God, through the story of the Bible, made a way for us to have that relationship by sending his son, Christ, to come be our sacrifice for all of our imperfections. And by believing in that and that alone, we're privileged to have a relationship with him and eternity with him forever. And so most people are pretty excited when they get the message of the Bible. We'll take questions after if that's okay. But today I'm just going to make it real simple. Uh, we're going to deal with, and I'm not going to race through this, so if we don't get through this, it's fine. We'll get through the rest of it next week, and we'll pick up with another shorter question. Uh, how do we know the Bible is a reliable book? We have manuscripts that give us evidence that the Bible has been transmitted reliably. reliably. We have the oneness of the Bible. There's one thread that goes through all 66 books. We have the idea of prophecy, which gives us proof that it is indeed a supernatural book. We have two kinds of prophecy. We have general prophecy, which we will get to tonight, and we have messianic prophecy, which we'll talk about when we get there. And then the last thing is, what does Scripture say about itself? Because any witness in a court of law is entitled to give his own testimony, and we want to see what the Scripture says about itself. So tonight I want to talk first and foremost about the manuscripts. We have two parts of the Bible. We have the Old Testament, the first three quarters of the book, and the New Testament. By the way, how many books are in the Old Testament? Oh, scholars we got here. How do we know? There's 39. How do you remember that? How many letters are in the word old? How many letters are in the word testament? How many books are in the Old Testament? Good. Very good. How many books are in the New Testament? Not 39. We have three letters in the word new and nine letters in the word testament. Three times nine is 27. So in the whole Bible, we have how many books? 66 books. And these books after having been written, were passed down from generation to generation, from generation to generation. Some of them started out as oral uh, tradition. The New Testament, uh, our problem is one of quality because we got tons of manuscripts. We have 25,000 manuscripts of the New Testament, and they're finding more all the time. The first time I taught this uh, was probably 35 years ago, and at that time we, were, we had 14,000 manuscripts that were written between the time of Christ and the end of the year uh, 200, about 2 to 250 AD. So we have thousands of manuscripts that give us an idea of how this thing came to be and why there are variations and how we can make it work. The Old Testament, on the other hand, uh, we had Zippo. You know. Now, this was not always the case. When the King James Bible was translated in the year 1611. <laughs> Lewis, were you alive in 1611? Were you a friend of King James? They only had six Greek scrolls, and the New Testament was written in Greek. Now we've got these 25,000 scrolls, and again, the issue is brought up. Well, certainly errors have crept in from translation to copy to copy to copy. So I want to address the New Testament first. The New Testament stands up very well when you put it up against other ancient literature. 
For instance, Homer is a book we've heard of. If you've watched the movie The 300, it comes from the Iliad. And the Iliad is probably the most documented manuscript of antiquity. It was written in 800 B.C. The earliest copy we have of Homer is 400 B.C. So there's a 400-year gap between Homer's life and the writing of the Iliad's manuscript. And we have 643 of those manuscripts. And the scholars look at those 643 manuscripts and they say, based on what these manuscripts say and the differences, we're able to reconstruct an original. That's what we're trying to do with the Bible. Point needs to be made that we don't have any of the original books of the Bible. We'll understand that along the way. But part of that's just age. You know, you're not going to have me much longer. But when you have a book that was written in the New Testament 2,000 years ago, and it's stored on library shelves, how many of you even own a book that's in your house that's 200 years old? So for a book to be 2,000 years old, especially in Florida, where we have humidity and hurricanes and torment, uh, the paper just doesn't hold up very well. So the manuscripts that were produced at the time of Jesus were produced around the Mediterranean world where there was also humidity. And so were the other Greek manuscripts. I read Plato in college. I know it's hard to imagine this, but Gwen and I had a course with a political science professor, and we read a little bit of Plato's Republic. It was written in 400 B.C. He lived at the time of, of uh, Homer, and it wasn't manuscripted in terms of being able to date a manuscript until 900 A.D. So 1,300 years after Plato lived is the first manuscript of his Republic. And yet no one ever stood up in my class in pol political science and said, wait a minute, how do we know that over 1,300 years a lot of errors didn't creep in? People said, oh, no, this is just what Pilate, uh, uh, Pilate, Plato wrote. Did I say Pilate? Uh, okay. <laughs> Caesar's the same with his Gallic Wars. Tacitus is the same. We have 20 of his manuscripts, but there's a 1,000-year gap between the time Tacitus wrote his annals and the time that he lived. Whereas in the New Testament age, uh, it was written between about 50 A.D. and 100 A.D. Most scholars agree that's about when it was written. And uh, the earliest manuscripts actually we have of some of the New Testament are as early as 90 to 100 A.D. We have a, a piece of the book of John called the Rylands Fragment, which scholars date somewhere around 95-ish A.D. Think about that. John wrote somewhere between 90 and 100. So what John wrote based upon that and the separation between his writing and the date of the manuscript, didn't take that, that long. We have 6,000 Greek manuscripts. We have thousands of other that are in Latin and Syriac and Coptic and Egyptian. And so, again, when I used to teach this, we had a total of 14,000 manuscripts 30 years ago, but archaeology continues to find new manuscripts. I went to seminary with a guy named Daniel Wallace, and he's the professor of Greek and New Testament at Dallas Seminary. Uh, he spent about 15 of his summers traipsing around the ancient world and getting permission from various monasteries and libraries to go into their uh, stash and photocopy these manuscripts. Because the, the, the leaders, the monks, and the clergy realized the manuscripts were crumbling. So he did a remarkable job, and every once in a while they'd find a brand new manuscript that no one had ever looked at. So then they looked at this manuscript and they say, how, how does this differ from the manuscripts we've got? Greek is about 5,600, Latin 10,000, Ethiopic 2,000. Again, that's how we come up with the number uh, 25,000 or so. An ancient Greek manuscript actually looks like this. It's written all in capital letters and, uh, and, and what you have to do is figure out where the words begin and end. There's no grammatical marks, there's no quotation marks, there's no periods, commas, or question marks. And so you have to go into the manuscript and say, all right, where did the words start and stop? And so that's how some of the textual concerns came up. And there are thousands of these uh, variables. Uh, first one that gets us at your table wins a prize. Let me tell you what the prize is after, but here's the prize. Who gets, who gets this, st this statement? Who can read it? If you can read it, thank a teacher. <laughs> how, do you, how well do you understand capital, sentences with capital letters with, with no spaces? That's what the scholars did. Now, why are you able to do that? Because you're completely familiar with the English language, right? And because you're familiar with the English language, you can do what the scholars call textual criticism. They study these manuscripts, and they're able to divide the words up 
and put grammar in there so we can look at it and we can understand it and we can process it using the English language today. Our Bibles were not translated from a translation from a translation from a translation. Our Bibles were translated from a Greek text that the scholars put together from these thousands of Greek manuscripts and came up with, a, with an original manuscript. Now again, it's not 100%. But the stats are it's about 99.6 or 7% that we know that what we're reading in these ancient manuscripts is what the original writer wanted us to get out of that. So that's a big deal to me. And we have variants, you know, but we have variants in English. You know, here's, here's a whole bunch of them. Uh, manuscript 1, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world without a D on it. Manuscript 2, he's the Savior. Christ Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. Manuscript 3... Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world with the L. Manuscript 4, Jesus Christ is the V with no E, Savior of the world. And Manuscript 5, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Now, if you had five different manuscripts that read in these five different ways, what would you say the original manuscript had to say? Christ Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world. That's the obvious message. And so, again, people get all caught up. You know, the Da Vinci Code made millions of dollars on this, you know. <laughs> There are all these mistakes in the Bible. we got the wrong books in the Bible. They're not really inspired. They're, they're written by the winners of history. Uh, but that's all it was about. It was about, let's go back to the manuscripts and say, what was the original intent of the author? And again, almost always, the scholars agree 100% of the time that the obvious message is that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world. So that's a real helpful thing for me to get. I understand there are variants. I understand the manuscripts were compiled at a point in time. But the, the, old, the, the New Testament stands up very, very well when it comes uh, to be compared against other literature from 2,000 years ago. The evidence for our New Testament writings is ever so much greater than the evidence for many writings of classical authors, the authenticity of which no one dreams of questioning. And if the New Testament were a collection of secular writings, their authenticity would generally be regarded as beyond all doubts. It's a quote from F.F. F. Bruce, who wrote a great little book years ago called The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable? He was a textual criticism wizard. I think he taught at Princeton, is that right? Yeah. So brilliant man, uh, and, and, he, and he did a great job for us. That's the New Testament. The New Testament, the problem is, is one of quality because we have variations, but we have thousands of manuscripts. In the Old Testament, the problem is one of quantity. We didn't have a lot of Old Testament manuscripts. Now, why is that? I'll tell you why that is. Because in the Old Testament, the people who wrote the Old Testament down are called the scribes. Say scribes. 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 And to be a scribe was a big deal. Everything was done by these scribes. And the word scribe in Hebrew is the word sofer, which means counter. So when they copied manuscripts... They counted the number of letters on every page they were copying. And they had very specific guidelines for their job. And let me give you a few of them. These are 8 out of 30 that appear to us in the Jewish writings. They had, the, had to have the correct recipe for the ink of the text. They had to have the number of columns per page exactly copied right. They had to have the number of letters per column line. They couldn't go over 30. They had... Uh, the exact spacing between everything, letters, words, lines, sections, everything had to be exact. The, the scribe was only allowed to look from here to here. He couldn't look at 30 words, he could look at two words. And then he had to come back here and write down the two words. And then he had to go back and forth and check. The scribe had to wear a certain clothing that was considered pure and clean by the Jewish standards. And lastly, if there was a mistake made, even if you were in the middle of the book, the whole book got thrown away. The Jews worshipped the text of the Old Testament, almost to a point of fault. So when the old manuscript had been copied, and when it had been used for hundreds of years, they didn't just throw it in the trash bin. They had a funeral for it. They would actually have a ceremony, and they would bury it, or they would burn it, but they had a complete ceremony, and that's why we don't have a lot of manuscripts of the Old Testament dating back to the beginning of time when it was written, starting with Moses in somewhere between 12 and 1400 B.C. Because the Jewish people loved the Scriptures. They idolized the Scriptures, almost to a fault. 
And so we just don't have the manuscripts until something very important happened on August 13th, 1947. There were two incredibly important events that happened in world history on August the 13th, 1947. First one was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the second was the marriage of my mom and dad. <laughs> Making the world possible for me. I'm so thankful. My dad's still alive. He's 96. This was done in the northwest sector of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is on the right, uh, left-hand side of the map, and up there in the northwest section is an area called Qumran. There was a community of Qumran or Essenes that lived there, particularly right about the time that Jesus was alive, a little before that. And it looks like this. You know, when you go to Israel, this is what you see, right, Joe? Joe was just there with us in March. Several of you have been with us, right, Doris? And you can, these are actually the caves that the Qumran community used to have the burial ceremonies for the scrolls. There are, I believe, 12 caves in which they found scrolls. And the way they found the first batch in 1947 was a couple of Bedouin shepherd boys at the end of a hot day knew their goats to get cool had gone up the cliffs into the caves to, be, to stay out of the sun. You know, there's no old goat like a, dumb, like a dumb old goat. You get smart, you stay out of the sun. And so at the end of the day, they would take rocks and they'd throw them into, into the caves and they would chase the goats out. Well, when they threw rocks into one cave, I think it was cave four, if I'm not mistaken, later to be called, uh, they heard a shattering. And the shattering was of a, of a clay pottery jar. So they climbed up into the cave and they found... Uh, books of the, of, the, of, the, of the Old Testament. In fact, every single book of the Old Testament except one was found in those caves. The longest scroll is the scroll of Isaiah. You can visit the, Egyptian, uh, the Israeli Museum in Jerusalem. This scroll is 27 feet long and it's uh, displayed in a circular manner. And the coolest thing about it is when I go to Israel and we go in to see this scroll, my guide can read this Hebrew text. Because it's the same text that he learned and his kids learned. And guess what? I can read some of it too. I know a little Hebrew. He was a tailor in New York. No. The <laughs> lids. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, for, thank you very much. I'll be here all week. <laughs> the lid on the clay pots was in the shape of this white dome. That is actually the, the, the roof of the museum of the shrine of the book. And the pots looked like this. And they have some of the original pots and some of the original manuscripts on display now. Now, what was the importance of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Oh, it was so big of a deal. In fact, they sold the first scrolls for 25 bucks to a Palestinian dealer in Jerusalem. And then this guy, being the businessman that he was, he said, you know, I got one scroll, but if I tear it up, now I got two scrolls, now I got four scrolls, now I got eight scrolls, and he, he threw it, in, threw it tore it up into hundreds of pieces. Finally, a rabbi in New York, an Orthodox rabbi, bought all the pieces he could for a quarter of a million dollars back in about 1950. So these scrolls were studied in depth, and what they found was astounding because what it did for us, it bridged a gap that had not been bridged before. The Dead Sea community of Qumrans existed anywhere from about 150 to, to 50 B.C. But this scroll of Isaiah that I just showed you was written in 700 B.C., and we didn't have any copies of the Hebrew Old Testament until 1947 that predated 920 A.D. Think about that. 1,700 years had gone on, 1,620 years. And I'm, the obvious question is, Jesus was alive there at the cross point. Was he reading from the Old Testament, which he did in Luke chapter 4? Was that the same Old Testament that the rabbis read from today or that our rabbi across the lake reads from on Sabbath? And the great thing is the Dead Sea Scrolls cut that gap down from 1,620 years to 675 years. And then they studied intensely to see what changes had occurred over this period of time from 125 B.C. when the Dead Sea Scrolls were written until 920 A.D. when the earliest scrolls prior to that were found. Am I making sense? Okay, thanks, Robert. So we closed this time span up by 1,000 years. And one of my favorite passages of the, of the Bible is the, the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The time span between the original writing and the earliest available copies is now significantly reduced. 
Isaiah 53 is a messianic passage. Okay, Let me just read you a couple of verses. See who you think this refers to. Isaiah 53, surely our griefs he bore, he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening, chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord had watched. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. Who does that sound like it's referring to? The Messiah. Let me tell you a quick story about Isaiah 53. When, when my last year of college, I'd majored in about six different things. And by my last year, I was just majoring in getting out of Philadelphia. I was married. My wife was putting up with me. But I did student teaching for a semester. And in the, in the Philadelphia world, we had a big Jewish population. And so I was in a high school class, and they gave me my own wingding for, you can have these kids for six weeks. Just don't screw this up. So I said, okay, over six weeks, you got one assignment. We're going to have discussions every day. But I want you to write a two-page paper for me. Who do you think Jesus Christ is or was? Good assignment for high school seniors. These kids were only four or five years younger than me. We got along great, but I had this sweet little Jewish girl come up. And she said, Mr. Diaz, actually, she called me Ed. I let them call me Ed. They thought I was cool. She said, uh, I'm Jewish, and I don't think I want to write about Jesus. I said, you know, that's, that's totally fine. I said, is there something you'd like to write about? She said, I don't know. I said, let me ask you this. Do you know Hebrew? She said, well, my grandpa's a rabbi. I said, how about, we, how about you do this? Go to your grandpa, and if you guys would sit down and read from the Hebrew text, Isaiah 53, because I know what I think it says. I know what the English says, but I'd like to know what the Hebrew translation says from somebody who's good at this. She came back the next class. She said, Mr. Diaz, we have a problem. I said, what's the problem? She said, Isaiah 53 is not in our Bible. And what had happened was over the years, the rabbis knew that Isaiah 53 so specifically referred to what Jesus had to have done for us that they took it out of their Bible. Kind of like Martin Luther with the book of James. There's nothing new under the sun. You know? And so uh, when we got the Dead Sea Scrolls, guess what? Isaiah 53 was there. <laughs> And, uh, and now most Hebrew Bibles have Isaiah 53 in there. But let me tell you about Isaiah 53, because in Isaiah 53, there are 667 individual letters, 166 total words. And over this thousand-year gap, there were only 17 letters that were different between 125 B.C. and 920 A.D. Of the 17 letters that were different, 14 of them were minor spelling changes. Gwen's mom was from England, and she used to go nuts when she did the crossword, and they'd ask for the word honor. In our language, honor has how many letters? Five. In England, it has six, because they throw that extra U in there. And so most of the, the 14 of the, the letter changes were spelling changes. Between the Jews that were over here and the Jews that were over there, they just picked up a different spelling. The other three letters were for the word light. And the scribes at Qumran, the Essene community, have these huge written records of the battles between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. And so it's not unusual that the Essenes would refer to light in almost every chapter of their Old Testament. So what that says to me is over these thousand years, the scribes who were so detailed and specific about how and what they copied and how long it took and how the numbers added, they knew what letter was in the middle of the book of Genesis. If it didn't add up, they got rid of Genesis. What letter was 10% of the way through, 30% of the way through, 40%? They, everything had to match up because the sofer means counter. With me? And so the Jewish scribes gave us great confidence that what we are seeing is, is written exactly the way the original writer would have wanted it kept. So we have both Old Testament and New Testament evidences that the documents have been transmitted in a reliable fashion. Now, why is that important? It's important because the authors of many of these events were within a very few years of Jesus. This is a picture taken in my hometown, October 28, 1960. It was right before Halloween. I was 10 years old. So this is 62 years ago. 
And on that day, JFK came to my town. It was a huge deal. John F. Kennedy was the first Roman Catholic president elected in America, and my town was probably 80% Roman Catholic. So there was a crowd literally of 40 or 50,000 people there, and we only had 30,000 people in the town. And uh, my parents took me. I remember I climbed under a tree so I could get a better view of him, and I listened to him talk in his Boston accent. Uh, I also heard Bobby talk, his brother, right, right before they killed him, two weeks before he died. He was in Philadelphia, and I heard him. But JFK was there, and I can write an account of JFK being there because even though it was 62 years ago, I have memories. There are people older than me that have other memories. We have newspaper accounts. We have accounts from the presidential record where he was, what he did. And so 62 years later, it wouldn't bother any of you if I sat down and wrote down, here's what happened. And that's really what happened with the gospel accounts in the New Testament. You know, Jesus uh, died somewhere around 33 A.D., okay? Uh, Mark might have been written as early as 45 A.D. Mark writes Peter's recollection of Jesus' life, okay? Matthew is possibly the first gospel written. He's probably somewhere around 45 A.D. And John is the last gospel written, somewhere in 90-ish. He was the youngest of the disciples, we think, and lived on into the end of the first century A.D., and so again, they had access to their memories, they had access to friends, they had access to people. Clearly, Luke spends a lot of time with Mary, the mother of Jesus, because Luke gets all the Christmas details, the swaddling clothes thing, only Luke, Luke gets that. And so he was a historian anyway, and even though he, he writes to the Greek world, you know, they're different historical accounts, but they have a different viewpoint in what they're trying to get across. And so that's how the Gospels were accumulated over time. So the, the thing is, I have great confidence that what we know about Jesus in this book. And what we know about the Old Testament characters in this book was handed down by people who saw these things go on. John chapter 19, the, the apostle says this, this report, John says, is from an eyewitness account, I, eyewitness giving an account, it is pres presented to you so that you can also believe. John takes seven of Jesus' miracles out of the three plus years that Jesus ministered. There were dozens and dozens. John said he did so many things that if you wrote them all down, the libraries in the world wouldn't hold the books. But I'm going to pick these seven, and I was an eyewitness to these seven, and I want you to get this. So again, we have a piece of the Gospel of John called the Ryland's Fragment that's right around 100 A.D. It's just a remarkable thing to think about. We have texts that we don't have the original book of John, but we have things that were copied soon thereafter. And they were treasured, and they were preserved, and they were circulated through the churches of the first century. Peter says, you know, we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor, what? With our own eyes. You know, Peter talks about the transfiguration in 1 Peter. Peter was there on the mountain. He saw Jesus' clothing turned so white as no launderer on earth could whiten it. So Peter says, this is what I want you to get. And these documents were preserved meticulously and handed down through the churches. And so we know that the Bible is reliable because of the manuscript evidence there. Again, I don't have 100% knowledge, but based upon legal historical documentation, the Bible stands up really well. Okay. That's manuscripts. We'll take questions at the end. I want to get through oneness because oneness doesn't take very long. There is one story from Genesis to Revelation. What is the message of the Bible? The message is that God wants to have a forever family. The problem with that is he, and we talked about this last week, where evil and sin and corruption came from, he gave us free will. And with the choice that we make, there are consequences. And one of the consequences is spiritual death. And so God says, hey, I love you so much that I will send Jesus to die in your place so that you don't have to die eternally. You can be with me eternally. And that's the message of the Bible. And there's oneness there. If you take the breadth of the Bible... There's 1,500 years in which the Bible is written, from about 1,400 B.C. to 100 A.D. There's 66 books. How many books are in the Old Testament? How many are in the New Testament? How many in the whole Bible? 66. There's 40 authors, maybe 39, depending on who wrote the book of Hebrews. There's three languages at least. We've got Greek, Hebrew, and a little bit of the Bible is written in a language called Aramaic. Uh, there's three continents involved, you know, Asia, Africa. Uh, and Europe is involved in the production of this book. But there's one message. There's a unity to the Bible unlike any other thing. Now, let's suppose that we didn't have 40 authors. Let's just take 20 authors. Let's go get 20 students from Florida Southern. 
And let's, instead of have them write about a bunch of stuff like is in the Bible, life and death and purpose and values and all that stuff, let's have them pick one subject. Let's have them talk about politics. Or you pick it. Abortion. Something that's controversial. And let's have them write down what they think about this topic. What are the odds that 20 of them would come up with the same detailed explanations? None. You know, that's how, by the way, how Chuck Colson came to Christ. When he looked at the New Testament, he said, you got all these 11 disciples who are willing to die for Jesus. And if that was a lie, they wouldn't have done that. He said, when Watergate happened, there were eight of us, and we all jumped off the ship like rats as soon as we got discovered. So people aren't willing to die for, for the lie, let alone uh, the disciples are willing to die for the truth. So the oneness of the Bible gives us great validity to uh, the validity of its message. I want to take you to one other place, and this is one of my favorite passages, and then we'll finish up the last part next week. By the way, if you're interested in the oneness of the Bible, I've got a series I'd be happy to send you a link to. Uh, I, I, I traced every book of the Old Testament. I have a series called Jesus in the Old Testament. You can find a picture of Jesus in every book of the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In the book of Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In the book of Leviticus, he's the fulfillment of atonement. In the book of Numbers, he's the snake on the pole in the wilderness. In the book of Deuteronomy, he's the prophet that comes after Moses. I could go on and on. And it's wonderful to see the unity of the Scripture as it per pertains to the person of Christ. Well, we have manuscripts as M. O is what? Oneness. And P is <laughs> prophecy. And as I said earlier, there are two kinds of prophecy in the Scripture. The first kind is general prophecy. Not specifically like Isaiah 53 is messianic. But a, my favorite general prophecy, and this can get a little involved, so be a little patient with me, is Ezekiel 26. Ezekiel writes in about 600 B.C. Okay? And part of his prophecy is directed against the city of Tyre. Say Tyre. How many of you are tired? It's late. I'm going to get you through this. Notice there's a point that juts out. Tyre is north of Israel. That southern jut out there is Haifa. It's, a, it's the only thing that Israel has that's like a port. Okay. And so a couple of hundred miles north of Israel was Tyre. Tyre was part of the Phoenician Empire. And they were pretty spectacular. In fact, uh, Lebanon's ministers of tourism, they're in Lebanon now, uh, said Phoenician Tyre was the queen of the seas, an island city of unprecedented splendor. And it controlled the Med. They had great ships and great sailors and great merchants, and they gained great wealth from this. So they were a choice uh, place to be. And they were so powerful in the Med that they became a target for conquering. From the north, coming in from the north, in 586 B.C., also conquered Israel, was King Nebuchadnezzar of the Bede 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 Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar said, Tyre, I want you. And so he laid siege to Tyre. Ezekiel 26 says, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and I will bring up many nations against you as the sea brings up its waves. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers, and I will scrape her soil from her and make her a bare rock. She shall be in the midst of the sea a place for the spreading of nets, for I have spoken, declared the Lord. Now when that was spoken in 600 B.C., Tyre was the most powerful commercial center in the world. It would be like somebody showing up today and saying, New York, L.A., you're done. You're going to be scraped raw. Nothing is going to happen there except fishermen are going to clean their nets. Tyre consisted of two parts. This is a map from 322 B.C. There was an island off the coast, about a mile, that was the island part of Tyre. And then on the coast itself was the mainland of Tyre. So Nebuchadnezzar comes in from the north, and he lays siege to the the town on the coast. Thirteen years he tried to starve them out. And so you know what they did? They swam to the island. They got on their little boats and headed out to the island and went, ha, 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 ha. Finally, after the siege of 13 years, uh, they made peace and they allowed Babylon to rule over them. And that was in 573 B.C. Now fast forward to 333 B.C. Who was the great man that came in 333? Our only great man in history, Alexander, right? So he shows up, having conquered the Babylonians and, and the Persians, and he 
says, I want to defeat Tyre. Meanwhile, all the people of Tyre are out there on that island city. And they're going, nanny, nanny, boo, boo. That's Tyrolean for... <laughs> they're giving him the raspberry. Alexander was hot. You know, Alexander was a young man. He was an impatient man. He conquered the whole world in a very few short years. But the island city of Tyre remained. But in 332, the year after he came through and took Israel, Alexander the Great was denied entrance to the island city. It so angered him that he built a causeway to the island using the debris and stones and dirt from the destroyed mainland city. Now, we live in Florida. We know about causeways, right? But that was a brand new idea back in 332 B.C. After months of effort, Alexander took the island, killed 8,000 of the armed defenders, and took the other 30,000 people and sold them as slaves. And guess what's left of Tyre? Not much. The city was later, later conquered by the Greeks, the Muslims, the Crusaders. Finally, in 1291 uh, A.D., it was destroyed and never has again, again regained importance. If you want to see what Tyre looks like on a satellite map, that's it. And guess what goes on on that peninsula to that island city today? Today, according to the sources in Beirut, the Sidonian port of Tyre is still at use today. Small fishing vessels lay anchor here. The port has become a haven today for fishing boats and a place for spreading nets. Point of all that is, I can't prove to you that this book is inspired. But there are no scholars that doubt that it was written long before Alexander came and built the causeway and destroyed the island city. Ezekiel was written at about 600 B.C., plus or minus, even if it's 550 B.C. Alexander didn't show up until 332 on the world stage, 333. So again, I, I can't prove the book's inspired, but I can say, okay, in terms of world events, world history, people, places, things, kingdoms, rulers, even specific details down to the very tiny detail, the archaeologists and the scholars say, let's go see what the Bible says because it's, ha it's never been proven wrong. So I think the Bible is a reliable source. We have good manuscripts. We have the oneness of the scripture. And then we have the prophecies, the general prophecies. And next time we're together, we'll talk about the messianic prophecies. Okay, let's pray and then we'll do questions. Father, we love you. We thank you for your book, which gives us the story that we believe, that Jesus came, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross for us, that we as a result of his death, have forgiveness and the promise of eternal life. We are blown away by that. We are blown away that you would write us this long love letter called the Bible in 66 books with one story. And we ask that we'd better be better students of that and be better at sharing our love for you and our love for our Lord with others. In Christ's name, amen.